Today we have a love <laughs> today we have a live session with talented printmaker and illustrator Rowan Sie and she's based in Australia. She created intricate, beautiful prints uh, using the technique that is made has different names like block printing and so on. And we will talk about all the behind the scenes about how to create a block print also how to sell these prints and how to create an art book if you don't want to miss any of these uh, highlights from the interview on all the tips you, you're welcome to subscribe to the newsletter the link is in the my bio or in the description and i am excited to invite Rowan. yeah i see the Painting or how to sell these prints, how to turn your art into art business. You're very welcome to drop any questions in the comments. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Yay. It's so nice to finally meet you. Yeah. Yeah, me too. So happy to see you. And oh, I see your studio. I, I was so impressed by your videos, how well you organized all the tools in the studio. Oh, it's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> I spend some of the time in here mm -hmm. and then part of my, part of my time I spend um, working out in my, on my dining room table in the family home. So I kind of spread myself out a bit. Thank you so much for, uh, for finding time to this live session. And I'm really very excited to know more about how you create the prints, how you turn into an art business and about your incredible book. All your prints are so detailed, so beautifully and well done. Um, how did it start? When was the beginning of your art journey? Can you share with us a story, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, I've always been arty, arty and crafty um my mum was someone who did always had a mate lots of projects on the go and my dad is a doctor but he also loved to paint and we were the kind of family who would they would make sure that we took sketchbooks with us when we go on holidays and we go to a museum we'd be the family like sketching in the museum <laughs> and that's this practice i still do even though the rest of my family is like what are you doing mum um so i was always arts and crafty but at school i was kind of told there's no career in art um so i was put off doing it um in school and i was interested in languages and things so i actually went all the way through university and went all the way getting a phd in international relations um but i always felt like I was an imposter, like I wasn't in the right place. And I felt incredibly anxious uh, at the thought of going into academia. And then I had children. And when my children were very little, I was doing a lot of sewing and um, sketching and working in art journals. Uh, so I was doing a lot more arts and crafts then. Um, but then my youngest daughter uh, in her first year of life uh, was diagnosed with cancer and we had nearly a year of being in and out of hospital. And during that time, um, cr pursuing creativity, watching YouTube, working in my sketchbook, doing art journaling was really uh, um, life saving uh, in terms of you know, for my mental health and for passing the time in what's a pretty boring place and a really nerve wracking time. Uh, luckily, AJ is good. She's out the other side. And when she was getting a bit bigger, I was doing more and more. And then um, I started doing um, a few things for friends. They liked it and it kind of snowballed from there um, and at the same time I was doing um, like Instagram challenges and doing 100 day projects on Instagram and that kind of built so eventually I remember saying to my husband actually this is what I want to do all the time it makes me feel really good um, I'm good at it I want to be an artist um, full-time and he went oh, there goes the mortgage 
<laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, he was, you know, great. Has has been really supportive. Um, and then, you know, it's all been a learning curve from there. And how many years ago? What was what was this um, the beginning? So if we go from the beginning of Little Rowan Redhead, when I started Little Rowan Redhead, um, that was in 2016. And at that stage, I was actually doing more watercolor than, oh. um, than printmaking. Um, I think I was, I had set myself a 100 day challenge because I wanted to get better at watercolor and I had done a different watercolor every day and a organization called Raw. Um, picked me up to ask me to do a showcase and I didn't have you know a name I was just little old Rowan at that stage um, and so I did this showcase showing my watercolors again kind of people liked it and I said oh well I'm gonna have I'm gonna have a little business name little Rowan redhead because I you know got red <laughs> and I'm pretty short and um, and yeah so that, that was that was August 2016 Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> not so uh, not, not so long time ago actually uh, and you did uh, such an amazing uh, job since then because when i scrolling through your account or on your website i see that you already have created so many amazing prints and even a book and uh, it's a huge thing uh, what inspired you to create this book um well i I had always liked the idea of doing a book, but I was probably a bit too much of a scaredy cat to be proactive um, about pursuing it. Um, and I was just very lucky that um, an editor from Hardy Grant, which is the publisher, the UK arm of Hardy Grant, um, an editor reached out and said, hi Rowan, I really love your stuff. Have you ever thought about doing a book? And I went, <laughs> uh yes uh terrifying like i absolutely terrified at the thought of it um but i was taught a long time ago to say yes to things that scare you and you can just kind of try and work it out from there um so i said yes okay and the lady <clears throat> the editor helped me to pitch it um and they accepted it and um, we went from there. Uh, it was really strange because it was, uh, I think as I was waiting for the contract to sign, um, Sydney went down into a six month lockdown. Uh, so I considered the book my COVID baby while other people were learning how to make sourdough, <laughs> I wrote a book. Um, but it took a little while to get things organized. Um, but in terms of the inspiration, Inspiration. I am a craft book nerd. I have lots of craft books. Mm -hmm. My mum had craft books. I was raised on craft books. So the thought of doing um, a craft book was kind of right up my alley. So I already had a notion of what it might look like. Um, and I was teaching at the same time. So again, it was an extension of what I was already doing. It's so exciting. Actually, I, had a, I have a lot of questions about the book, but uh, we will jump into that blog a little bit later. And first, uh, can you first uh, introduce, because uh, someone who is uh, watching us, uh, they don't know, they're not familiar with your art. Can you walk us through your creative process? Uh, how do you create these incredible prints? Uh, how much time does it take? What, is, what are the steps? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, so I'm... So as I said before, like I started with watercolor, but I always really enjoyed printmaking. I enjoyed it at school. Um, I really enjoyed uh, carving lino. Um, but when I got started to get back into printmaking, uh, I found lino too overwhelming because it's really difficult to carve and it's even harder to print. Um, and I had a bit of an aha moment one day. I was watching an artist called Julie Balsa and she doesn't carve lino. She carves like a PVC rubber, a soft carve rubber. Um, she uses the speedball pink. We've got a, um, an even better version mm -hmm. of it uh, here in Australia. 
And I kind of went, oh, wow, I don't have to go. I don't have to necessarily carve lino. I can carve rubber. It'll be easier on my wrists. I can carve for longer. Um, and I kind of started from there. Um, from there, that was kind of carving small stamps on a, on a, at a, pretty much every day. Uh, and from there, I've ended up taking that practice larger. Um, so now I carve, um, like quite large blocks, um, kind of a four and a three sizes. I'd love to go bigger, but I don't really have the space in my, um, studio at the moment, maybe one day when I've got an amazing big studio with a big press, I can go huge. Um, but so I kind of make do with what I've got at the moment. My work is mainly inspired by Australian flora and fauna. Uh, Australia has amazing uh, flowers, wildflowers, um, in, intriguing shapes, uh, quite sculptural forms. Um, and we've got amazing bird life as well. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly inspired by, um, by the world around me. Um, and I love flowers in general so I'll just go for a walk through my neighborhood and immediately become inspired by you know maybe the nasturtium on the side of the road or um the magnolia out in bloom um that's all you need to do right, right? is sometimes go for a walk and you're in inspired and you um so that's what I suppose what inspires me on the daily um in terms of how long it takes um that really depends on the technique i'm choosing to use so even within printmaking there are so many ways that you can choose to go about it so i always start with sketching i used to be amazing like you keeping these gorgeous art journals full of you know filled with colorful posca pens now i've got a bit lazy polina now i'm mainly um using my iPad um, just because I find there's less step, I suppose, between using the iPad, I can then print out my sketch and then I transfer it. Um, but also I like it because it just gives me very easy, quick access to thinking about layers. Mm -hmm. And if I'm doing a reduction print, for example, a reduction print, you start with one block and then you carve oh. um, away each layer so that by the time you get to the end um the 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 block is destroyed but you end up with maybe a seven six or seven layered print but working in layers on the ipad kind of helps me to think about what i'm deleting so i will use my layers to erase the layer and then i can see the um colors underneath so it kind of gives me an idea before i even start cutting the rubber how those uh layers are going to interact um, and so i do um, sorry. So just, sorry, uh, continue. Please continue. I just have many, <laughs> many questions. Finish. So, um, so I always uh, keep, I always um, love to um, work on the iPad uh, and then I usually print out the sketch. I will trace it and that's how I end up tr um, transferring it onto the rubber. But even before I get to that stage, I have to think about, okay, I've got this, you know, I've got like the three color sketch, which I really like. Now, how am I going to translate that into a print? There's different ways that I can do it. I could choose to use like one main block, like a one main color, and then you could hand color in the extra colors, or you can cut stamps to color in the colors. Or depending on the print, if it's um, if there's quite a lot of the second, third, fourth colors, you might choose to do four separate blocks and print them on top of each other, which is quite dicey because you've got to make sure that it's registered properly. Or I might do a jigsaw print, which is where I use one block and I cut it all out, ink it all up separately, put it back together and then pull a print. Or I could do a reduction, which is, um, as I say, the, the, the process I described before. And that you'd use if you had lots of, in, um, lots of color all over the place and it was really hard to um, isolate that color. Um, so you kind of got to have that in mind before you even start carving, right? Because you've got to know whether you're doing one big block or whether you're doing multiple stamps. Um, yeah, and then I carve. 
which I love. I love the carving aspect. Um, and then once you've carved, um, then you print. So then you get to roll out your ink and play with colors and, um, listen to that gorgeous sound of relief printing ink on the, on the tray and, um, and get the reveal peel, of course, which everyone loves. That's the main thing people come to, <laughs> I think, come to my feed for is just to watch that, that reveal. Yeah. What is your favorite approach uh, of uh, printing? Oh, that's like asking me to choose my favorite child, ah, Polina. I okay. can't do it. <laughs> at, the mo at the moment, I'm very into reduction printing because I think um, it's, it's such a big process. It's very nerve wracking because once with reduction printing, you have to prepare everything up front. You have to prepare all your paper uh, and all you, you've got to like make sure that it's registered properly. So you've got to set up tabs You've got to do all the preparation to begin before you start to carve and then print your first layer. Because once you start, you can't, once you go to that second layer, you can't go back in the process. Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, print it afresh because the block will keep changing mm -hmm. and look more and more unrecognizable. So for me, it's very nervy, but when it works, you get wonderful depth of color and the interplay between layers. You just get a real complexity that you just can't get in any other way. Um, but then again, I quite like a jigsaw print too, because it's fun to put them all together and, and, and kind of print it all in one. It's a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, With this, uh, reduced, uh, printing, you can't then, uh, make, uh, additional copies because your print block is ruined. So how do you decide how many copies, uh, will you make? Because there will be no chance to repeat it. Um, that is a good question. <laughs> Sometimes you have to just go, okay. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of the beauty of it, right? Is that it's a true limited edition. Um, there's, there's value in that. I think uh, someone was asking me at a market the other day, they said, Oh, what are these numbers? I said, Oh, well, that, that indicates exactly how many of that, um, edition there is. And they're like, Oh, so this is like two out of 25. This is, there's only 25 of these. I said, yeah, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're rare, they're valuable. There's something quite nice about it. In a world where we can just keep making and making and making, it's really nice to keep it limited. And um, and also I think as an artist, it's good to go, okay, I, I'm pouring my heart and soul into this right now, um, but then they will be gone and it's time to move on and do the next one. So I just sold my last one of my, one of my favorite prints the other day. And I did have a little moment. It was like, goodbye, my pretties. Um, but you let it go and you, you move on and, you know, hope that the next one will be just as popular, but sometimes it's not. And that's just the nature of it. Do you set the higher price on this limited prints? So with. Uh... For the reduction prints, reduction. I make them. They're they're my they're my my most expensive prints. Yeah, because they'll never be because they'll yeah. never be printed again. And I know some people who choose to do reduction prints, and then they scan the one of the reduction prints and offer them as G clay prints. I don't. I don't feel. I don't feel. I right. No, that's right. That's their choice. But I feel like there's something special about saying there's 25 of these and that's it. And in terms of choosing the number, well, I mean, some people will start with like 100 pieces of paper and try and get an addition of 100. But I just don't have the space for it's, you know, because you've got to do it all at once. Yeah. You've got to have uh. all the space for drying it. So I'm usually hindered by that. So I go by I kind of prepare 30 to 35 pieces, knowing that I will lose some along the way. I have a a couple of questions more about the process so mm. you create the sketch uh, into the uh, ipad on an ipad mm -hmm. and then you say that you print and transfer how exactly do you transfer these outlines mm. to the block yeah so i use good old tracing paper mm -hmm. and a graphite pencil mm -hmm. <laughs> um and trace it and then um, I flip the tracing paper onto my rubber mm. and rub it, rub it on so that the graphite transfers 
cleanly onto the rubber. You can do that on lino as well. Um, it's a little bit harder. Sometimes people use um, like a carbon paper underneath to transfer mm -hmm. onto the lino. But what I like about the tracing paper method is that it automatically reverses your image so that when you print it, it's the right way, which is not a problem for most things. But if you've got any lettering in, in um, your uh, block, then you need it to be reversed so that it prints the right way. Yeah. Also about carving blocks. I, um, when I was studying in the university, I was experimenting with lino uh, and it was pretty hard actually. And I was even a little bit disappointed because I thought, oh my God, it's so hard <laughs> to carve that. And uh, then years later, I just uh, found this uh, very, like a, it's like a rubber all right uh, this uh, art blocks um and it's so easy to work with them why do people use this lino hard uh, surface is it just because uh, people tend to use it because before there were no other materials or is it really so durable that it's better to, cho to choose this or any difference i don't know well, well i have blocks i mean i'm sorry i have had some lino purists say Rowan, you should be, you should be, you know, um, you should be carving lino. I love carving lino, by the way, the carving of it. I, I really um, enjoy. There's something about it. You have to kind of heat it. There's a few tricks you have to do to try and heat it. You can even sit on it to warm it up. Also, I think a lot of people don't know that um, lino is cuts best when it's fresh mm. and I think in many art stores, often the lino might have been, might have been, depending on how popular lino is in that area, sometimes the lino is sitting there for ages um, and it becomes harder to carve the older it gets. But as I say, lino is best warm. So sometimes people have like a heating iron that you put on it or um, you could use a bit of a, um, a heating gun or, or you can just sit on it. <laughs> um, however, um, and I think lino is quite good to use with a press although I, I found printing it really tricky even with my little handheld press and my tabletop press I've always found lino really hard I find it um it, it's very thirsty so you have to ink it quite a you know you have to ink it a lot you have to have just the right amount of ink in order for it to print properly and I do find that it also fills you know all my little lines fill up so every time I use lino I get frustrated and I end up going back to soft carb um lino I think probably is a little bit more environmentally sustainable and I always say this to my students when I'm teaching them I say look we are carving pvc rubber so which is a man-made product whereas lino even though it's man-made it's got more natural it's like made of cork and stuff so it's um i think it's less um less bad for the environment i try to get around that by using as much as possible i buy it in squares and i try and chop it down and i try to be as versatile with that product as possible you can even use the little shavings to like stuff stuff a door stopper or make stress balls um, i've done it all at this stage i don't keep my shavings anymore i do i do uh I do um that would take a long time <laughs> there are ways to get around it but so i think there's that and i think traditionalists people um people really like lino but i've got blocks that i've been using for years that are still holding together even with the pvc rubber and i also know some lino um sometimes the lino breaks so it's a little bit more expensive the PVC rubber, I think, as well. So um, if you know if that's if that's uh, if money is an issue, then, then that's something mm -hmm. to consider. Um, but what I really like about the PVC rubber is that, as I say, it's very versatile. I can chop it up into small, much smaller um, stamps, or I can use big ones and then put different pieces together. I like it that I can use ink pad on on it. I can use acrylic paint um, paint. I can use relief printing ink. I can use fabric printing ink. I can use all these different things. Whereas I've tried with lino in the past to use other mediums and not enjoyed it as much. Um, so, you know, and I still get lovely fine lines with the rubber, beautiful intricate cuts that comes down to the tools, you know, the file tools that I use, um, you know, you got to do what you got to, sorry. <laughs> 
I over talk, Paulina. That's always been my problem. <laughs> no, no, that's great. That, that's wonderful. I was wondering, how often do you use, or maybe you don't use at all, the old uh, blocks that you carved a year or two ago? Uh, do you sometimes maybe take the flower that you carved uh, a couple of years ago and incorporate it into a new print, or is it? Or uh, there is a store because I can imagine the, that you have like a storage with uh, so many. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that is a tiny amount. Yeah, <laughs> all of these are filled with with stamps. I've got about four big tubs full of the big, like the bigger blocks. Um, I do think there is value in revisiting your work even though i believe in kind of moving forward i think there is something nice about revisiting work that you've done and incorporating either a motif or refreshing it um and using it in a different way it's like recycling your own work um and i think there's something really nice about that because it changes and progresses um, as you go. I mean, you must have found that in your work as well, that you've got certain motifs that you you love bringing back and then using afresh. Yeah, I have some motifs that I repeat uh, in different colorways, um, but also there is a way when I work in Illustrator, and for example, I drew multiple flowers in one, uh, many, many flowers in one uh, pattern, and then uh, I, I created a pattern out of that, but, uh, a few months later, I decided, okay, why not to use, uh, take this and this flower and create another pattern using the same uh, vector forms that were created. And uh, this is really, you have different artwork, artworks, different patterns in the end. So this is why I'm curious, can we repeat the same with the block printing? Or because it's the final piece in the square, it's harder to kind of mix them together i think i think it depends um what you're working on obviously with reduction printing no mm -hmm. once that block is done it's done um but if for example okay so i've got a pomegranate um print that i did a couple of years ago and one of the pieces of the print just is not quite right so i'd quite like to take the pomegranates and kind of create a new piece similar but not the same maybe you know still featuring some some pomegranates but maybe changing up the background and so i can take that the basic pomegranate stamp that was the middle of that other print um and i can use that use that afresh i'm often taking especially since you know i work with a lot of australian flowers um every every year or so i've become inspired by the flowering gum blossoms or our wattle or banksia banksia flowers come up a lot in my work um, and there's only so many ways that you might be able to represent uh, a banksia but maybe you could do a different composition or maybe you can bring in a different um color palette also I'm curious about the process of uh, making the final print because I see uh, on the internet uh, different ways when you put a print on paper and paper on print. I tried mm. both, but as I am not a professional block print uh, maker and just I did it just for fun, I can say that uh, I can define which one is better, what is the difference. Uh, is there any difference actually? What uh, approach do you use? No, I don't think so. For me, it just depends on what the print calls for. So, for example, I, I often use both techniques even in the same piece. Mm. So, for example, um, in my uh, – I've got a big um, poppy print, um, which I call fleeting. Uh, and the key block, the main block, which, you know, is all the poppies cut out and it's in a vase – that's that I ink up first and I lay the paper over um, and pull a print that way. It's quite nice. I, I like laying the paper over. I always hand press. So I like that tactile feeling of being able to know where the parts of the rubber are that I need to make sure that I um, touch, <laughs> make sure that I, uh, that I, adhere i'm trying to think of the word for it um so i really like that process and then i like that that reveal obviously that works the best for a reveal peel when you lay the the paper over but then i use about 20 
six different stamps to colour the um, the poppies in. And I can't just lay the paper over because it's not you're not necessarily mm. going to be able to get it in the right position. Mm -hmm. So all of those um, poppy um, colours I hand print um, top down, so like a stamp. Um, it works really well. I think sometimes depending on how hard you press, you can squish it a little bit, then you'd get an uneven print. But I think that just comes with practice. That's just technique of, you know, the more you do, the, the better you understand what, you know, that you, you need to be able to have that ink nice and light, but good courage, press, but don't press too hard. You know, that just comes with, with practice. Yeah, now I see uh, how it, it's more clear now to me. Uh, let's jump to the next part. Uh, when we have the prints uh, and we want to sell them, <laughs> we can do yes. this. Yes. <laughs> Selling. Oh, that old, <laughs> that old chestnut. We want to keep making the art. We need to pay for our art supplies and for our time and, and all the rest. Um, yeah, look, it's tricky. Um, I was talking to someone about it the other day because I do quite a few markets. Uh, so I have various ways that I sell my work. Um, obviously I, ha I have an online store, little row and redhead uh, And uh, so I sell via um, my Shopify site. Um, I also am on Instagram. It used to be better than it is now <laughs> in terms of uh, being able to sell via, via um, Insta. Um, and, but probably the main way that I sell my work is at art and design markets. So local markets. Are, um, so not so much, these are local markets, but they're not kind of your every week, um, little cutesy market that you can turn up at and get your, you know, breakfast and then go around a few stalls. Um, I tend these days, I started with those markets and did a couple of years of working in those markets. And they're hard, they're hard work. You don't necessarily make a lot of, a lot of money at those markets. Um, so I have, I changed a few years ago to only targeting big art and design markets. So these are usually markets that go for more than one day. Uh, they're curated. Um, they usually have certain things that they're trying to go for. So for example, in, in Australia, they prefer Australian made, they prefer um, kind of ethical, they're often looking at sustainable, you know, has all these criteria attached. Um, and so you end up getting um, a nice, you know, good, good quality of all the store holders. And hopefully if it's been advertised properly, um, you also get, customers who understand that what they're getting when they come to these markets are, um, you know, a designed, handmade, artisanal, Australian made, um, supporting local makers, et cetera, et cetera. And hopefully they won't quibble over price as much. Of course they can choose whether they want to buy, um, you know, uh, uh, one of my more expensive prints or a, or a cheaper print. You've got to make sure that you've got a, a, a range of prices in your store. But it's the best way, I think, in the end of, like, I'm quite a people person. I like to meet people. I like them to see me and get to know that there is a person behind the work. I get to explain my process in, um, you know, face to face. Um, and it's, you know, the nicest way, the nicest way I've found. So to, um, to participate as an artist in such market, uh, you have to first Google when, when and where it is. Then you yes. have to apply apply usually for... there's yep an application like five or six months sometimes before and they're not what? cheap markets to be perfectly honest like you have to you have to pay quite a bit of money to be in those markets you usually have a choice of how big a stall you're mm -hmm. in um and, and what is um, the range in australia for example between for pr stall uh, prices yeah. or yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 to participate um, there yeah so if if you're brand new, it, um, there's usually like a debut stall um, if it's your first time. So uh, 
I'm not quite sure what a day booster will cost the, these days. When I first started, I did my first find, it's called Finders Keepers here in Australia is one of the big art and design markets. And I did my first one in 2019 and my day booster was 500, about $500. Um, these days I spend about two and a half thousand dollars on a um, stall um, for three days. I just spent that um, for three days uh, and I think I've got three meters by two meters. So it's not a huge space, but you get really good at um, uh, you get efficient, you get really good at using your space. You have to try and be creative about the way that you present your work. Um, cause you're trying to set yourself apart from other people at the market, right? They have to kind of go, Oh, I haven't seen this before. The good thing about being a printmaker is that there's not too many printmakers. Um, mm. we, we, there's not as many of us. Um, I mean, it's the thing that does kind of set, set and, me apart. And you never know how much, uh, will you earn there on this no. market, right? No, so you even you even don't know how many prints should you prepare. Uh, nope. for the, oh. No, so <laughs> a gentle a gentleman across from me during this last um, last uh, market, he sells three D printed vases, kind of cool vases. He sold out on day two. He sold out by lunchtime, and it was there was still a whole full afternoon and another day. Um, and the organizers let him go home to just make some more stuff to put on his table. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing about being a printmaker and being compulsive, like a compulsive maker like myself, I will never sell out because I, you know, I'm always making, um, you know, that's just the, that's the way of it. Um, but there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work that goes into just getting to, getting to market. Yeah. But this market, I, I suppose they're once or in a half year or once in several months, but yeah. uh, the year is long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. what is the best way to get income from selling uh, your prints? Or is it uh, Etsy or another platform? So not Etsy anymore for me. I started off on Etsy. That was the first bit because of the ease. Um, I think Etsy has changed, but when I first um, started off, Etsy was a great platform just for, um, you know, the ease of setting up a little, a little shop. That was fantastic. Um, once I had been doing it for a few years, I had some um, business mentoring um, and they recommended Shopify. Um, and so I have, um, yeah, a little online store, Shopify. I find it quite easy to use. Um, and so, uh, I, so, sorry, do, do you create, did you create it by yourself on Shopify? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Originally I created it by myself. And then I think two years ago I got a little help to kind of spruce it up. So I ended up spending some money um, to, to get some help with that. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, Polina, I think it's funny when you start, you just get on and do everything yourself. And that means that you are not just the artist. You also become an accountant and a social media manager and, um, a designer and a graphic designer and, you know, all the things. And occasionally, um, uh, my, <laughs> My husband has come out and I've been crying and he's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I just don't know how to do this. And he says, well, ask for help. I'm like, yes, but, but that would take too much time to ask for help. I, I swear I can just do it. So I'm getting a little bit better, a little bit better <laughs> at trying to ask for help. Um, so maybe that would be some advice to people starting off is, don't hesitate to ask for help because someone sometimes throwing a little bit of money at it will actually get it done and make your life easier. So you can get on with, you know, the important stuff like making, I do feel sometimes like I spend way too much time doing everything else rather than the actual making, which is what fills my heart and makes me, you know, makes me the person I am. It took me several, years to start asking for help and to to find uh, other people who can uh, do this or that work and to, uh, where do you find them how do you find them oh. well sometimes word of mouth 
Um, being part of, I always recommend being part of local maker groups um, because we spend so much time by ourselves. It can be really lonely. Um, and even the thought, part of the reason why people don't ask for help is because even the thought of trying to find those people, like you said, just feels overwhelming. So you think, well, I, I can do it. I'm just, it's just quicker for me to do it myself. Um, <laughs> But if you're part of, um, you know, makers groups, sometimes you can put it out there and say, hey, guys, does anyone have an accountant that you recommend who deals with creatives? Um, does anyone know, I don't know, um, does anyone know about this recent social media that's come out? Does, can anyone recommend it or, or give their tips? Um, you know, it's really important. I think the sharing of information and yes. being generous with the information that you give as well. I think it's really important. Are there groups uh, on the Facebook or? Um, where? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the groups that I belong to are on Facebook. Facebook's still good for something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, for example, I'm on, um, the organizing team of a volunteer organization here in Sydney called Sydney made. I'm the treasurer. I'm in charge of the money. Um, and we have a, um, a Facebook group. So for, for mm -hmm. Sydney makers and people will often come on and go, Hey, I'm selling my stall equipment. I'm not doing the market anymore. Um, does anyone want to buy my stall marker, uh, stall equipment, or I've got too many paper bags. Does anyone need some paper bags? You know? <laughs> um, so that's really helpful. And then you kind of end up having a community. Yes. Yeah. That's really helpful and very supportive, I think. And how uh, do you promote your shop on Shopify or I, all of your clients find you on Instagram? Mainly through Instagram, Instagram, Pinterest. Um, I would say TikTok, but I'm really, I'm not very good at posting on TikTok. It's a different, I find that a different kettle of fish. Um, I find that I don't have strong engagement <clears throat> through TikTok. Um, but I still, I still get good engagement. Instagram, nothing like I used to. Um, I was an early adopter of reels and I remember I used to get like, 500,000 K views. I'm lucky these days. I had the Grivalia one go well the other day. And I think most I got was about 25,000 views. So that's, that was a big one for me, but usually these days, not, not like we used to. Um, so I think there's a bit of organic stuff that happens through Google, but I don't, I probably should pay for advertising. But, um, but that's kind of also what markets are for, you know, I think people forget that markets are not just for selling your product. It's for also to get your face and your art out there, um, out in the real world and get people to see it. So making sure that those interactions you have with people are always good ones, even if they don't end up buying anything, just, you know, trying to get them to understand your process that I think just introduces yourself to them in a positive way that then people go, Oh, Oh, I saw her at such and such, or I've been following her on Instagram. I saw how she made that piece. That's really interesting. And then, uh, you know, more likely to be positive and want to maybe buy a little piece of the Laurent redhead. Mm -hmm. um, I have maybe my personal question. Um, it's not about numbers, but the percentage uh, is your income is mostly from selling prints or workshops or selling book? Mm -hmm. Not from selling the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, very proud of the book, but it wasn't, it's not a, it wasn't a big money earner. <laughs> and it, it hasn't, um, yeah, in the time that we've got allowed, I should probably say a few things about the book, but it, it was an interesting experience. And the experience after creating it has also been a bit eye opening. Um, but back to income streams, I would say these days that I have maybe four main streams. So um, the money coming in from selling my art direct to customers. That's probably majority of my income. 
Um, I make a good little amount with um, doing commission work. I, I, I do house portraits for a local real estate agent. So whenever he sells a house, he gets me to paint a picture for, for his customers and, um, you know, and he pays me each, each painting. So it's one of those things that looks probably not the most interesting uh, work to do, but it's, it's steady and he's a great customer and it's nice to think those paintings are going off to, to people who, who do actually, I've met a couple of people who said, Oh, you painted our house. And, um, and you know, they were really positive about it. So I do a bit of commission work. I also have started, um, to sell my, uh, my work wholesale, but not so much my lino prints. I also have stationery. So I sell my cards, um, notebooks and decorations. So now those are going to stalls. So I've got my wholesale business. I've got my retail business. I've got my workshops um, and um, and commission work. Those are kind of the main the main four four streams of income. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing. I think it's very interesting always for even uh, especially for beginner artists who do not understand how to earn money yeah. with their art. So thank you very much. For I think sharing. it's an you've got to have multiple. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Um, or I mean, yeah, some I people can, like some people who have just got like bonkers on gone. I know someone on TikTok, um, Shelby Sherritt, um, who I knew when she was just kind of starting off and she's gone, like gone rocketing up through TikTok and YouTube and good on her. Uh, it means that she has real choices about what she can do. Um, but, um, for, the regular Joe, like myself, you've got to have multiple ways of, of, of making that money because, as you said, you don't always have those markets all through through the year. You have them at certain times of year. This time of year, going into Christmas, this is where I'll make most of my money for the for the year. Um, so it's it's crazy busy from now from now on until Christmas. So you, you have <laughs> already started uh, preparing to Christmas, right? <laughs> mm. Yeah, well, this market that I just did, which um, was amazing, actually, it was my best market I've ever done. Thank goodness I needed I needed it. Um, that was kind of OK. So maybe we can kind of hopefully from now to the end of um, until Christmas Day, um, this will be, you know, kind of working, working towards that. Um, which is tricky because also you want to be doing fun stuff. You want to be exploring and playing and, and, and working on stuff that you love to do. But at the same time, you're like, well, this is the time that I have to make the money so that the other time of the year I can do more experimenting or, or um, kind of working on some bigger pieces that take longer. Um, yeah. For me, it's one of the challenging things uh, in art business to have this steady income because actually I never know how much I will earn the next year. I, I try to plan, but still some months are really high, some are low. Do you have any yeah. tips or strategies how to plan? <laughs> I'm still working that out. I'm still working that out. I, 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 um, I laugh because you will have a period of time where you, you know, you're quite flush and uh, maybe you've had a couple for me, I've had a couple of markets and money's coming in and you're like, woohoo, that's great. Um, but then of course you, you have to actually keep that money aside because so many of the markets next year, I need to pay for well in advance. Um, for a wholesale market, for example, um, wholesale markets are very expensive. They can be five, six, seven grand. Um, uh, so I've got a bit of a payment system going on. So, um, so I have to, each time that I get a win, each time I have a, a successful market, I have to kind of take half of that and go, you know, that I don't get to pay myself that I have to kind of make sure that I've got money aside for those upcomings because then I have months where it's quite quiet and th that money still needs to be paid, but I don't, you know, if I didn't reserve the money in the first place, I mean, slowly, I, every year I've got a little bit better like a little bit more money. Um, but I think, I don't think people realize kind of cost of goods, 
how much cost of you know how much it costs to um to have your art supplies to have your all the things that are involved in being the artist right all your subscriptions mm -hmm. that you have to have you know adobe doesn't miss you um uh if you've got an accountant um insurance uh all of that just costs money so um yeah trying to manage that i as i say still trying to work it out Pauline. i don't know if i have any great tips <laughs> you also mentioned that you sell your stationery and other things uh do you sell it by yourself on the, your website or i mean that if you sell it by yourself you have to make all this packaging and then uh, deliveries things uh, or do you collaborate with uh, some store and uh, just provide your designs there uh, how does it work um so i have i now have um a number of retailers around australia which is great um but yes you are in charge of making sure that everything is packaged and pretty and sent on its way so uh, again you kind of end up being that in itself is quite a big job um i employ my daughter Oh. Uh, at a fair at a fair wage um actually both of them could but it's mainly my 15 year old at the moment she she uh, will you know put put cards in the plastic sleeves and um you know she she's quite good at that um you know you have to try and find ways to to save yourself time um and giving her some work is is <laughs> is a good way to do it uh uh, there's a question in the comments Kia or from New Zealand. I recognize the Kiwi accent. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can, uh, can you tell me how large of a print run you did for your first lot or printed items? Thanks. Can you tell uh, me how large of a print run you did to your first lot of printed items? Oh, I'm not sure that how large a print run. Um, generally okay so i have a couple of prints that um i will print 10 at a time mm -hmm. um but say i will cap it at i've got a, my poppy print for example is a limited edition of 100 but i don't print the 100 all at once i will print say 10 10 at a time um but once i get to 100 that's it but with that one, it's a limited edition in that particular colorway. So if I chose, because the poppy one, I'm like, oh, it's going to be a hard one to, to let go. But maybe I might choose a different colorway and that would be a different edition. But we'll see. I might get to the end and go, no, time to move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if you re uh, see or read the comments, but there are fans of your prints. and during Hi, the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's very sweet. It's very nice to have people come and visit you in your store and they're, you know, I mean, I mean you must get a bit of it as, as well. Um, when they've seen a lot of your work and they have seen your videos and you don't necessarily know them, but they feel that they know you and they just come and say hi and say, I just wanted to come and meet you face to face. And it was really lovely to, you know, it's, it's such a nice interaction. It's a really, that's, the lovely side of, of social media yeah time runs so fast i know uh, okay I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay th th then i will just uh, say uh, ask you about the book that you yes. have the modern block printing should i so should I pull it out Look, yeah this it is, it's so beautiful i really love the cover <laughs> uh what was the most challenging things in creating this book and what was the most rewarding things just uh, the main highlights of yeah. creating an art book for you yeah so i mean the most rewarding thing is being able to have it like it's tangible look my my you know i'm on the back i'm in the, i'm in it all my work is in it um it's such a lovely record of where i've been and 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 where i was at that moment you know um and a progression from what i was doing Doing, which was, it was teaching and I love teaching I really love sharing what I know so um so that I think is the best bit oh and also um the photo shoot uh was so much fun it was just such a lovely experience I had a local photographer and a local stylist they both live literally in the next suburb um so that was brilliant um 
what is challenging is that the publisher was based in the UK. Even though Hardy Grant is an Australian company, Hardy Grant UK published it. And that meant there were, there were sometimes there was some communication issues, there was time delays, things were a bit tricky on that front. Um, also with regards to the photographer, they said, oh, well, we don't, we don't know any photographers in Sydney, so how about you send all the projects to the UK and we'll photo, photo, we'll, photo we'll, we'll take all the photography in the UK. And I had to say, no, 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 no. <laughs> I will find a photographer. It is. It can be done. If we send it to the UK, it will be out of my reach and I won't have any creative control. So I really pushed back on that. I'm glad I did. Um, the tricky thing is, and what I want people who are going in to publish or get working with a publisher, is that just because they hold your hand when the book is being made does not necessarily mean that you will get much support afterwards. And that's what I've found really hard is that um, even though it's in their interest to really um, promote the book and to support me in promoting the book, there wasn't, I didn't feel that there was much support. And now it's been two years since my book came out and I can't, I, it's really hard to get copies in Australia um, and I can't get a hold of anybody. So if anybody's listening out there, <laughs> contact your local bookstores and ask for modern block printing. I'm trying to say to the publisher, there is a, there is still a desire for this book. Um, because, and I know there is because I'm getting asked about it a lot. Um, so that's the tricky thing about it. And I would just say to anyone who's going into like self publishing is, is actually pretty awesome and that you get to retain control of so, so much. Um, obviously the financial risk, you take that on board, but um, at least you get to control if there's reprints or, um, you know, what the numbers are, how many copies there are. I don't have any control in that. So, um, so that's the frustrating thing about it. I'm very proud of it. I'm super glad that it's out in the world and I would absolutely do it again. I would just maybe be a bit more aware of, you know, the realities of, of working with publishers. Um, would you like to create another book? <laughs> Yeah, I would. I've got a few ideas. Um, the same publisher has the rights to my second one, uh, or at least they had the right to for the option, which is annoying. But um, I like the idea of doing maybe looking at block printing traditions around the world, just because I want to do some travel as well. <laughs> I thought if I can make my travel tax deductible, <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> And how long did it take you from the first uh, sketch of the book uh, to the final, to the day when you send the final files to the publisher? How many months? Um, not, not that long, actually, um, because the contract didn't get, I don't think I start, I said to them, I'm not properly writing it until I get my first advance. <laughs> So they had to give me some money first because I said, well, otherwise, you know, anyway, so I had the plan, but I didn't do any writing until they sent it. Um, and I think it was November, December, January, February, Ooh, four cool. months. Um, but, but I mean, I had all the ideas and then obviously we hadn't done the photo shoot. The photo shoot happened in March, pretty much after the manuscript was settled or at least all the writing was sorted. And then obviously we had to just check that all the photos lined up with the manuscript. Um, yeah, and I think that happened like in April. It was, it was off in April. So yeah, it was quite, it's it, not as long as you, as you think. It took me longer to write my PhD. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, my final question, uh, because it's really an, Oh, past. So my, uh, my final question, what advice would you give to a beginner artist or maybe what would you say to yourself when you were at the very beginning of your artistic journey? Um, uh, okay, so probably a couple of things. Um, by all means, say yes to many, many things, but also you, you have to get to a point where you say no so eventually 
no, it's not okay to do something for free or give away art for free just because you will get some exposure. Um, you know, I think you have to have some boundaries um, and certainly around your own self-worth, uh, the worth of your work and your own self-worth because also you, in, you will end up devaluing your own work and other people's as well if you kind of price yourself too low um, in order to get exposure or what have you. The main thing is always create from the heart, be authentic, create work that you love, not work that you think other people will love. It's got to come from you. Yeah, beautiful words. Thank you, Ryan. It was a big pleasure for me to talk with you. Actually, I feel like I have more questions I would like to ask. Oh, you, no! But, uh, we have to finish 